Chapter Thirty Eight of God's Fool by Martin Martens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. The Power of Attorney. In a doorway, he came upon Alers lounging up against the portiere. Oh, come out of this! He said impatiently. I can't stand any more of this. Can you? And he passed on towards the staircase, bright like the rest of the house, with greenery and hothouse flowers and far-spreading lamps. Alice lounged after him, with a quiet smile which distinctly meant, I can stand it, and I can do without it. I am superior to my environment. But then, unlike Hendrik, the young lawyer had no nerves. Sit down somewhere, commanded Hendrik, as he sank down into a chair in the repose of his own sanctum. Don't stand about, please, Thomas. Let us get a sensation of rest for a few moments, if possible. He drew a couple of cigar-boxes towards him, and extracted a company cigar. So much enjoyment, surely, six pennyworth, he might rightfully appropriate out of the lavishness of his wife's fete. He pushed the box across to Thomas. "'I was thinking,' began the letter, as he leisurely struck a light, "'how very pretty Adelheid Overdeck looked in that old-fashioned puce. I had no idea there were such possibilities about her.' "'No possibilities for you, my dear boy,' replied Hendrik, glad of the opportunity of saying something pleasant to his friend. "'The Overdykes are the most retrograde people in the city. They still persist in marrying each other, and vegetating on less than ten thousand florins a year.' "'I was not thinking of myself,' answered Alers. "'I know very well that Adelheid Overdyk is growing grey for her cousin Isidore, or at least she will have to unless he make up his mind. Now, if my heart would condemn me to matrimony, I should never make the mistake of appealing to my brain. "'Your heart?' said Hendrik, with an audible sneer. "'Ah, you think we have only got them when we wear them on our sleeves. It is not those who possess the highest decorations that parade them most obtrusively in their buttonholes.' "'Don't talk nonsense to me, Tommy.' cried Hendrik impatiently, stretching out his little feet, and staring at them, as was his wont. "'Sentiment from your lips is nonsense, because you don't mean it, at least not to me. What is this that Cornelia tells me about some wonderful new plan of yours? Another syndicate? I wish you wouldn't speak of these matters to Cornelia.' "'I spoke of it to her as a private affair of my own,' answered Alice carelessly, watching the bluish clouds from his cigar. I didn't trouble you about it, because I had understood you to say you were never going in for anything speculative again. How can I have said that, protested Hendrik irritably, after the mess I've got into? It's all very well to cry out, I will stop, when you've gone over the cliff. What am I to do if Hubert finds out? Hubert will not find out. But supposing he does? The whole thing may flash on him at once from some stupid word of Elias's. They're always with Elias nowadays. The children are sent over to play with him. And Hubert goes almost daily to visit him, as my father used to do. And now I've just heard that my sister-in-law has been quietly busy for some time practising her elementary Dutch on his neck and hands. Ah, that was your mistake, said Alice. You should have kept Hubert away a couple of years longer and then all would have been right. I, as if I could forbid his returning. I'd hard work enough, as it was, to obtain any respite at all. And you said exactly the same thing at the time, I remember. Could you keep him out yonder a couple of years, then all would come right. Well, I succeeded in doing so, and what's the result? If there were not always an element of uncertainty in these matters, said Alice, I should no longer be a poor struggling lawyer, with a milliard there. "'You denied the element of uncertainty in this syndicate,' said Hendrik, "'and the day after you denied it, the subscription failed completely. I had to take up every penny of the sum I'd guaranteed.' "'I know that,' assented Alers impatiently. "'I can't help it. Whoever could have thought the public would have behaved so idiotically. Well, the shares stand in Elias's name. They'll be worth a lot of money some day.' Will you take them at ten per cent? How often must I tell you I am not a capitalist, Hendrik? 
What's the use of crying over spilt milk? Don't let's talk of money matters. I didn't begin, though I really believe I've got a good thing this time. I'd quite as leave keep it dark. Let us talk of the company upstairs. Listen, that is young Titus van Bussen singing. Ah, but I would much rather talk of the money. It was that abominable syndicate, Alers, which first compelled me to invest Elias's money in shares. I'd never done so before. I should never have done it, of my own free will. It was not the syndicate, replied Alers, which induced you to buy the petroleum. It was, retorted Hendrik, for I thought it would be certain to go up one florin per barrel, and that would just about have covered the deficit from that syndicate of yours. That's right, Hank. Never lay the blame on yourself, said Alers. By the by, how is petroleum tonight? Gone down another fifty. That completes the third florin, answered Hendrik moodily. Phew, said Thomas slowly. One hundred thousand barrels, and a fall of three florins per barrel. That makes three hundred thousand florins, Hank. Don't I know, cried Hendrik fiercely, the offence I can no longer reckon out three times one or three. What a fool you are, Alers. Can't you leave a fellow alone? Let us talk of the singing, said Alers. Did I not suggest so before? It appears that they are encoring, young Titus. How conceited he will be. The last payment is due on Monday week, burst out Hendrik. I can't hold on. I shall have to sell. I must have three tons. Footnote. Three tons is three hundred thousand florins. End footnote. If I don't, I'm ruined. And where to get them, I cannot tell. In fact, I can't get them. Of course not. "'What will you do if you don't?' queried Thomas, again watching the blue rings of his cigar. "'I don't answer,' said Hendrik abruptly. "'Good heavens, Hendrik! You don't mean to say you are such a fool as to think of doing something desperate. Talk of calling me names. I return the compliment.' "'Am I the sort of man who kills himself?' said Hendrik, with a sickly smile. "'Everybody is.' answered the lawyer. All that is required is this sort of case. Every one of us can go mad, except the idiots. I believe you will survive everything, Hendrik, except commercial disgrace. Take another cigar, said Hendrik. By God, you're in earnest, cried Alice, in horror-struck tones. There was a moment of silence between them. The jingle of the music came rippling its laughter from upstairs. "'This is too horrible,' continued the lawyer. "'Don't let's talk of such things. It attracts them. Surely matters are not as desperate as you say.' "'I must have the money. Any child can understand that.' Again a short silence. "'You have that power of attorney still,' says Alers presently. The deed signed by Elias at the time to enable you to take the syndicate money off the great book of the national debt. You know the thing was only valid for a year. But my friend Lynx, as he was willing to make out one for you, would doubtless be quite ready to repeat the operation. Don't you see there's Hubert? cried Hendrik. If we take Lynx to Elias now, Hubert is sure to find out all about it and then I'm lost. Take Hubert into your confidence. Make a clean breast of it. After all, you've done nothing wrong. I can't, said Hendrik. I simply can't. Hubert has the absurdest ideas about our duty to Elias. He's chivalrous and mystical and heaven knows what. We don't understand each other. If I told him, he might run to the police. Don't be a child, Hendrik. I repeat, you have done nothing wrong. You decided to advise Elias to take some of his money out of government securities and to invest it in shares. As the law requires a power of attorney to enable you to represent your brother, the necessary deed was made out by my friend, who is a competent notary, and signed by Elias. The shares may be worth any sum in a year or two. Hubert wouldn't understand, repeated Hendrik, shaking his head. As for your other speculations, 
Those have nothing to do with the matter. But now you've got into a mess. What you want is, speaking plainly, for Elias to advance you the money. Hubert must help you in that. Your next speculation will succeed, and you will repay it. That is all. I am certain that, if Hubert understands in what degree the honour of the house, of the name, is involved, he will come to appreciate his personal interest in the matter. "'I daren't do it,' persisted Hendrik. "'It is exactly as you say, and quite true, but I daren't do it. If it were ten thousand, perhaps, or twenty, I might. But not three hundred thousand. I daren't.' "'Then, my dear Hendrik, you will go smash. There is always one comfort, replied Hendrik, in a low voice, that the complete smash is the finale. Look here, said Thomas, once more alarmed. Let me tell you first what this plan is about, which I dropped a word to Cornelia. I had hoped it would have made your fortune once for all. As it is, it may help you out of your difficulty. You can tell me, answered Hendrik incredulously, if you like. You know the South Sumatra Tobacco Company? Of course, said Hendrik testily. Its shares are on change. They touched five hundred above par a week ago. Their last dividend amounted to thirty per cent. Just so. Well, I am in a position to assure you that they will declare fifty-five at their next meeting on the eighteenth. On the contrary, answered Hendrik, that shows how little you know about these matters. I have heard it confidentially whispered that the very reverse will be the case. I know, said Thomas imperturbably. In fact, I know more than you think. It is being confidentially whispered, as you say, that the year has been a bad one. We are all aware of the instability of these tobacco shares. The South Sumatra companies are going down. They will sink very near five hundred in a few days, you will see. And the day after the public meeting, they will be up to eight hundred at least. I dare say, said Hendrik. Why not? Ahrensburgs are at one thousand and twenty. And who gave you this valuable information? That is my secret. No, I will make it ours. Truth to tell, my informant is no less a person than one of the board of directors. If you swear secrecy, I will tell you his name. All right, I swear. But Alers insisted upon an oath in propria forma. He was so evidently in earnest that Hendrik grew impressed. It is Langater, said Thomas. I had occasion recently to do him some considerable service in a professional way in connection with his wife. You understand me? Divorce made easier. Well, he gave me this hint. I can't, Thomas, said Hendrik. You must forgive me. Not after the syndicate. I daren't. And there was that other affair besides in which you were mistaken. I daren't do it. I assure you this is genuine, cried Thomas vehemently. I really want to help you. You're in a most terrible fix, and I was delighted with an opportunity for coming to your assistance. I can't think what you'll do if you don't struggle out. He was honestly alarmed, and it was perfectly true, as he repeated, that his information, as well as his anxiety to help his brother-in-law, could be looked upon as bona fide. He had really availed himself of this opportunity. It was in his interest also that Cornelia's husband should not go down in the sea of disgrace. But Hendrik, being a burnt child, hung back from these bright allurements. "'Look here!' cried Thomas, in final despair. I will tell you what I can do, and there is not another man for whom I would do it. I will shut you up in the big wall cupboard, you know, in my office, and, by George, you shall hear Lankater repeat the news to me yourself. Will that suffice you? You are very much in earnest, said Hendrik, musingly. I believe Lankater to be an honest man. Of business, said Thomas. Of business, said Hendrik. You shall hear the truth from his own lips, and then, when you know it to be exactly as I say, you must buy one hundred shares. Do you understand me? One hundred shares as near five hundred percent as you can. 
in a couple of weeks you can sell them again at eight hundred per cent it is too gigantic murmured hendrik is your need so small no but it's easy enough to say buy shares where am i to find the money half a million by jove bankers suggested thomas impossible every bond i possess has been used as security long ago besides half a million no the bankers must be left out of the concern again a silence a long one this time and the jingle of fresh music upstairs you must have the money said Aders. it is as you say there is no alternative and besides it is a case of complete ruin on one side and complete salvation on the other this is no time to hesitate where is the power of attorney let me see it but it's absolutely useless let me see it hendrik got up opened one of the drawers of his bureau and produced the document his friend took it and scanned it hurriedly then he read it over again slowly it would be impossible to alter the dates he said softly almost to himself thomas cried hendrik starting from his chair with livid face his cigar fell to the floor he did not observe it an immensity of sincerest horror weighed down the single word it seemed to linger heavy on the air of the silent room the young lawyer looked up quickly struck to the heart by the fierce emotion of the cry he smiled i was only joking of course he said these fellows take sufficient precautions against so easy a circulating library solution as that some things are not fit subjects for joking true your situation is too desperate for you to relish a joke well i must think out some method of assisting you i shall ask lynx whether the validity of this document cannot be prolonged your over-scrupulous conscience would have no objection i suppose if you were absolutely certain of success of this dividend business to purchasing a hundred south sumatra shares for alias to-day and to buying them back of him at the same price in a week or two if i were absolutely certain said hendrik hesitatingly no all we want is the loan of a few hundred thousand florins out of alias's government stock for a very brief period said thomas rising to his feet we must see that we get them you can't reiterated hendrik we must see my dear right worshipful i must deliberate but one thing if you please if i arrange this matter for you it is understood that twenty-five per cent of all profits go to me why asked hendrik taken aback why because the whole transaction is practically mine who told you about the south Sumatra company so be it thomas but i don't move a step till i've heard langater as you promised just now you shall hear him to-morrow or the day after and we'll put down our own little agreement about my share on a scrap of stamped paper it's always simplest to be accurate in these matters and now that is settled i'd better be going upstairs again the whole thing will be pretty nigh over by this time he put down his unfinished cigar on an ash-tray and carefully folding up the legal document slipped it slowly into the inner pocket of his dress-coat give me back that paper said hendrik anxiously holding out his hand i may as well show it to lynx and ask him what he advises you are perfectly sure that you could not get alias to consent to signing another perfectly sure both he and johanna would consult hubert at once well i dare say lynx will see his way to obtaining a fresh recognition there is no reason really you know for restricting these things to a twelvemonth no moral reason certainly only one of expediency aren't you coming up not to your own party not feel festive i suppose leave all that kind of thing to cornelia ta ta then it is worth while said the young lawyer to himself as he slowly mounted the broad staircase among the flowers and the perfumes and the lights it would be a risky thing perhaps if the chance of success were less certain but the money will undoubtedly be paid back again in less than a fortnight and then should anything happen to leak out 
Tendrick will be able to take the blame upon him as regards Hubert. Nothing succeeds like success. Twenty-five per cent, he added, as he turned to the crowded supper-room. For me it will mean, as for Hendrik, escape from otherwise irretrievable ruin. Does he think I am doing it all for Cornelia's husband? The magnitude of our need would excuse every measure imaginable. Ah, how do you do, Van Bussen? Your singing was excellent. The whole of that scene, I thought, was particularly good. Have they found out the word? Hendrik sat in the loneliness of his own room, his head bent forward between his two hands. He sat quite still. Once only he groaned aloud, and then coughed nervously, as if to cover the groan from himself. Is it possible, he thought, that I have sunk so low, and that my need is so terrible, that Alers could speak to me of altering dates? End of chapter 38